My name is Marigold. I'm the online editor of the British Journal of Photography. Um, I'm really excited to be in the presence of our four panelists today, who I will introduce shortly. Today, we're talking about transhumanism, which is a movement of artists, academics, inventors, and enthusiasts who are advocating for the enhancement of the human condition through the use of technology. So we're gonna be taking a deeper look at the movement through David Bintner and Jen Fletcher's project, I Want to Believe, which is currently on show at the festival. And we will also be gaining some expert insight into the potential implications of the movement in the near but also far future from two leading figures of the movement, Neil Harbison and Anders Sandberg. Um, so I'm gonna give a brief introduction to our panelists before we begin. Um, we have photographer David Vintner. David's projects explore human behavior and unique communities and events that connect people. He is driven by a curiosity about people's desires and is drawn to the obscure and unusual while placing human experiences at the center of his work. Alongside his personal work, David has worked on editorial commissions for people like The Guardian, GQ, The New York Times, and many more. So as you know, David is exhibiting his collaborative project with writer, podcaster, and photo director, Jem Fletcher. Jem specializes in writing about photography. Um, she is a regular contributor to the British Journal of Photography, as well as The Guardian, It's Nice That, and lots more titles. Um, she is also the photo director of Repost magazine. And in 2019, she launched the Messy Truth podcast, which presents a series of candid conversations with photographers, curators, and editors. We're gonna be hearing more from David and Jem shortly, um, but we are also joined by two very special guests who are also featured in their project. Dr. Anders Sandberg is one of the leading thinkers of the transhumanist movement. He is a senior research fellow at the University of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute. His research centers on management of low probability, high impact risks, societal and ethical issues surrounding human enhancement and estimating the capabilities of future technologies. Um, Anders is also one of about 2000 people worldwide who have signed up to the cryogenics program. Also joining us is Neil Harbison. Neil is an artist and activist, and he's also the world's first legally recognized cyborg. His antenna implanted into his skull allows him to perceive colors through audible vibrations. Neil identifies himself both as a cyborg and as trans species, which means he feels that he is technology and he no longer feels 100% human. Um, Neil is a co-founder of the Cyborg Foundation, which is an international organization that helps humans become cyborgs defend cyborg rights and promote cyborg art. He also co-founded the Trans Species Society, which aims to platform voices of people with non-human identities. Um, and also David's portrait of Neil is on the cover of the latest issue of British Journal of Photography, which came out today. Um, it also includes an interview with David and Jem about their work. You can order a copy on the BJP shop or subscribe to the magazine through an 1854 membership. Um, we're also going to be hearing more from Neil about his artistic practice uh, before moving on to an open discussion, which will then be followed by an audience Q&A. Um, but first, David and Jem are going to introduce you to their work, which is currently on show at the festival. So I will hand it over to you guys. Hello. David, are you going to share your screen? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh... Okay, well, thanks so much for coming guys. We're really excited to talk to you about this project and to have so many of our um, collaborators with, it, with us today. Um, David and I started this project six or seven years ago. I've actually lost track now. Um, and it was all based on this curiosity about harnessing the power of tech to evolve the abilities of the body beyond bio biology and kind of what these implications were for the future of humanity. So although these ideas have long lived on the page of comic books and sci-fi novels, the movement as kind of Marigold just described is very much a reality and it's starting to disrupt industries and individuals in a really meaningful way. Um, and also I think because we all know we're in a rate of unprecedented sort of evolution with technology, that's obviously having a huge impact on this. Um, 
And so this project kind of documents this critical moment in human history where we are moving forward into a new chapter. So the work that you can see on the screen now kind of demonstrates a myriad of ways of how our brains and bodies could be revolutionized and redefined through um, collaborating with technology, essentially. So this project is about transhumanism, but it's also about futurists. So not everybody in the project believes they are um, a transhuman. Um, but the profiles of transhumans specifically, which is probably what we're going to talk about a lot tonight, are so diverse. They're everybody from artists to CEOs, academics, bedroom hackers. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to think about how this project started because it was very much by happenstance. So as an art director, my job was to kind of be very creatively open and to generate ideas that I would then collaborate with, with photographers like David. And so I was always seeking uh, experiences outside of my own sphere of influence, if you like. And I basically found myself in a basement of UCL at the Futurist Meetup, which is a group run by a transhumanist called David Wood, where he would monthly gather a group of transhumanists or enthusiasts together, and they would essentially debate theories of the future. And my friend invited me to go. It was very random. I can't even remember how he found out about it, but just a group of friends and I went for every Saturday for six months. And it was fantastic. It was so interesting to hear all of these different ideas, many of which at the time went completely over our heads. And we would sit at the back of this lecture theater, kind of nervous, feeling like we didn't belong, but truly engaged in everything we were hearing. And I kind of went for six months and then just kind of forgot about it and kind of immersed myself into something else. And then when I met David, who kind of specializes in this sort of intersection of photography and technology, it just felt like, okay, perhaps there's something there and perhaps we could dig into this a little bit more. So David and I started working together and I think we shot six portraits. Neil was one of them. And we kind of thought that at first the project was done there. Um, we started to share it with people and we put it online and the project just kind of went viral. Um, David was getting calls every five minutes to have interviews around the world and there was just so much interest in it and we were really fascinated by it as well it become what grew to be kind of almost an obsession I think for both of us um, and so from there we decided that it just deserved so much more investigation so it is kind of ongoing but has been going on for about seven years now and the project now is kind of split into three different chapters. So the first one we call Testing Ground. So although ideas about transhumanism started as early as 1923, the movement is still kind of considered to be in its infancy. It's only really just getting going. But in the last decade, there have been significant developments due to this democratization of technology. Um, the resulting testing ground is, that, is opening up this kind of new frontier for wearable devices and digital tools that will enable us to extend our senses and abilities beyond human biology. And also just to note in quite radical yet accessible ways, not all of this is kind of out of reach to us currently. And one of the people that we photographed and kind of collaborated with early on is a brain hacker called Andrew Vladimirov. And he collects and analyzes brain data and he has quite an academic background. Um, but now he spends a lot of time stimulating his own brain or those of volunteers using a whole variety of methods and protocols. And he believes that he can reduce fatigue and enhance concentration and improve memory by firing a laser at different parts of the brain. Um, and as humanity is kind of moving through this sort of vast te technological evolution, he really believes that there is a very serious existential threat of a kind of big brother style surveillance using the technology that he's using. And he was talking to us about how, you know, imagine if a marketing company could actually feel how you felt about their product. And if they could feel that, then they could possibly manipulate your subconscious to buy that product. Um, so this is one of the reasons that motivates him to try and get ahead of the curve on this, because he's kind of worried about some of the implications. And we've got lots of quotes in the project that we've collected over the years, but I think Andrew's is one of our favorites. And he says, 
when we talk about human enhancement, it's the mind that's the most interesting part. Some people believe that we shouldn't do it because we shouldn't play God, while becoming gods is the aim. I think that still gives me shivers, that quote, whenever I think about it. Um, so often people come to this subject and come to this project and kind of only at first pay attention to the perhaps more extreme aspects of the movement, but there is such a growing and diverse range of applications for this um, sort of symbiotic connection with humans and technology. So Dr. Caroline Faulkner, oh, she's there on the screen, that's a great time, is, um, is using virtual reality to treat depression and anxiety disorders by increasing levels of self-compassion. Um, and these trials have been incredibly successful and the treatment is expected to be available on the NHS in the next few years. Um, so as you can see, there's such a diverse range of kind of applications here, some which are really hopefully in the next few years gonna be grounded in the everyday and be able to help people with you know, urgent issues like mental health. Um, likewise, one of the other projects I wanted to mention is a team behind Skin to Face, who we photographed again early on. And I've been thinking a lot about them in the last year through the pandemic when we've all been using tech as our main portal of kind of connection to our friends and family. And Skin to Face is this wearable suit that kind of enables a two-way interaction in the virtual world. So for example, if David and I were wearing it and we hugged, we would be able to feel each other even though we're apart. So you can imagine with that lack of touch in the last year and how isolated and alone so many of us felt, something like that could be so transformative if we were ever to go through something like that again. So there's just so much potential in some of these, just even with the wearable things that um, people are developing. And it's just um, kind of endless right now, really, in terms of the possibilities. And so this whole project is really trying to get people to think about the whole range of different applications of sort of merging with technology and how they can infiltrate so many different parts of our lives. Um, so the second chapter we call patient zero and these are individuals who have entered more of a post-biological evolution a little bit like neil who will talk to you in a minute um, so these are people who are becoming cyborgs and they're enhancing their senses beyond the, their original biological capabilities and in some ways becoming half half human half machine and these individuals believe that we can create new senses to experience reality in a deeper, more meaningful and more intuitive way. So it's a lot about optimization and living more sustainably and more in harmony with our planet, which people are always surprised about. Um, I think also there are some people who kind of alternatively think it will give us a competitive edge against robots and artificial intelligence. Um, so some of the really remarkable applications of tech in this context has helped and enabled those who have suffered from injury, accident or disease to take control of their bodies and redefine who they are, how they experience the world and how others see them. So one of our favorite um, subjects that we've worked with is a Canadian guy called Rob Spence, who's also known as the Eyeborg. So Rob lost an eye as a child while he was playing with his grandfather's shotgun. And inspired by the love, his love of the bionic man and his interest in documentary filmmaking, he started to develop a new eye, which had a wireless video camera inside. So right now, um, the camera's not connected to his optic nerve, but sends footage to a remote receiver. And over the years, he's played and kind of experimented with lots of different aesthetics for the eye, from a realistic human eye with a camera behind it to a Terminator-inspired glowing red version, which you'll probably see in a couple of minutes. Um, and then also, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Dangerous Things, and they're an American company who are known as grinders and grinders are people who hack their own bodies with DIY cybernetic devices to enhance the functionality of the body. So they practice implantation and Dangerous Things, uh, which is run by a guy called Amal Grasta, he um, is one of the companies in America who will facilitate this for you if it was something you were interested in. So similar to the way that we chip pets, this hardware is implanted under the skin to solve simple problems in intuitive ways. 
So radio frequency identification implants can replace keys or passwords, enabling us to kind of enter our home just by the swipe of a hand or turn on, unlock our computer with a swipe of our hand or our workplace or vehicles. Um, and then there's also uh, chips called near field communication implants, which can store data for us. So a little bit like the way our phone stores our entire contact book, we could have a chip in our body that could do something similar or hold particular personal data. So it's really interesting to see how a lot of these individuals are kind of redefining and pushing at the boundaries today. Um, and some, as uh, we talked, touched upon in the intro, like lots of people find this socially unacceptable. So it's a really interesting topic to look at the boundaries and kind of see how different people react to it. But it's been a real revelation working on this so far. And I think um, David and I definitely have kind of moved from a position of kind of being in awe and perhaps misunderstanding, being a little bit uh, perhaps underestimating the movement at the beginning. And now that we've been immersed in it for six years, I think we really truly believe in the potential here and that denying this or ignoring this is perhaps the most dangerous thing that we could do. Um, from there, I'll pass over to David to talk about the next chapter. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. So, um... Yeah, so the final chapter of the of the project we title Humanity 2.0, so the next the next phase in uh, in human evolution. Um, <clears throat> so moving on from the kind of body modification and designing of uh, of the body uh, for the present day, the the, uh, the the third chapter sort of looks at how for many transhumanists, uh, life extension and immortality uh, is the main aim. So through sort of experiments in genetic engineering and tissue regeneration, um, life extensionists view aging as a disease um, and their aim is to cure it. So um, one of the most uh, prominent voices uh, in that area that we, we photographed was uh, a gerontologist called Aubrey de Grey. So his job is to, is to study aging. Um, and his foundation identified um, seven key areas uh, which were key to focus attention on um, to tackle this problem. So. Um, through a combination which includes uh, gene editing and the regeneration of uh, bodily organs, uh, amongst amongst other things, um, he is seeking to reach this point where the technology um, sort of outpaces biological aging and allows humans to to rapidly extend their life expectancy. Um, so and at that point, we can um, uh, escape aging, as it were. So, and he's, he famously once stated that uh, alive today already is um, somebody who will be the first person to be a thousand years old. Um, so, and I just read an interview with him again this afternoon. That quote is about 10 years old, but the uh, interview I read this afternoon, he still stands by that. He still thinks we're... There's a there's a strong possibility that that is is the case. So um, dramatically kind of ex extending life expectancy, however, will will obviously alter what it means to be human and how we live our lives. So if um, if we no longer believe that death is inevitable, um, this drastically changes the, the, the whole meaning of, of our lives. So it'll be interesting to see. Uh, you know, down the line, how, how that uh, alters our, our perception of, um, of life, really. Um, so one of the other areas in this chapter was um, uh, cryopreservation. So this is the low temperature freezing and storage of a human corpse or even head. Um, and this is with the speculative hope that um, resurrection may one day be possible. Um, and it's described as an ambulance to the future. So, and uh, over one and a half thousand people across the world uh, have signed up to be cryogenically frozen. 
Um, and that includes pets as well, I believe. There's quite a few pets uh, <laughs> who are um, uh, in suspension in these uh, tanks. So, um, and then one of the other key areas of uh, transhumanist interest is, is the notion that the body itself is redundant. Um, so there's a commitment to the idea that in the future, uploading a human mind to a computer will become commonplace. So I think for me, one of the most interesting people I photographed uh, in the project was um, Russian transhumanist uh, Alexei Turchin. Um, and the reason, the reason I found him so interesting is because he, he, he lives and breathes uh, his theories and his ideas on a day-to-day -day basis. So Alexei spent several years researching and planning um, a roadmap to immortality. Um, and the map features several plans, uh, all of which he, oh, here he is on screen, um, all of which he follows simultaneously in case, in case one of these plans doesn't work. So plan A is a focus on life extension through leading a healthy life. Um, but if this were to fail, he's got plan B, which moves on to more complex ideas of uh, cryogenic preservation. Plan C looks at digital immortality, and then Plan D uh, explores the notion that immortality already actually exists. So Turchin has uh, signed up to be cryogenically frozen, and um, he's also a strong advocate for digital immortality. So what that means is that um, through a collection of monitoring devices, um, he operates a system of life logging which collates as much data about his day-to-day -day life as possible. So through the use of video, photographs, audio, um, EEG monitoring, and GPS locations, um, plus he collects physical data such as blood and hair, fingernail uh, samples, um, and he even keeps a decoded uh, version of his DNA on a, on a remote server. So the eventual aim of collecting all this data is um, to enable personality resurrection after death. So to recreate your um, uh, personality on a, on a computer, essentially. So many of the individuals in this uh, third chapter and across the whole project, actually, are, are motivated by something called the singularity. So this is a hypothetical future point in time at which technological growth becomes uncontrollable and uh, irreversible. Um, and this, is, this would result in unforeseeable changes to human civilization. So the transhuman prophet uh, Ray Kurzweil believes that by the year 2045, we will experience the greatest technological singularity in the history of mankind. Um, this is an event that, that could in just a few years overturn society and completely change the way we view ourselves as human beings. So although none of these uh, these things are possible right now, there's, there's a lot of momentum behind all of these ideas, um, all, all uh, pushing in that direction. So um, while a lot of these ideas are theories, um, uh, a lot of academics are following closely as the post-human state has uh, ethical and political implications for, for all of us really. So lastly, I before we open up the conversation, I just wanted to conclude with a quote from Nick Bostrom, who is um, Anders' uh, colleague at the uh, Future of Humanity Institute. Um, so his work concentrates on staving off future catastrophes that threaten humanity. Um, and the top, uh, top of his threat list is artificial intelligence and the idea that a superintelligence could threaten our very survival. So to quote uh, Nick from his book Superintelligence, before the prospect of an intelligence explosion, we humans are like small children playing with a bomb. Such is the mismatch between the power of our plaything and the immaturity of our conduct. So with that, I'll hand back to Marigold and um, uh, I think we'll move on with the conversation. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Jen, for that. Um, if anyone listening has any questions, which I'm sure you do, 
please write them. There's a little Q&A window at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, and we will revisit these at the end of the event. Um, so before we move on to the discussion, we're going to be hearing from Neil about his work. Um, so Neil, I will hand it over to you. Hi. Hi, thank Hello. you. Um, I'm happy to be here in Belfast virtually. Uh, my father's from Belfast, my grandparents are from Belfast, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to do something in Belfast for the first time, even if it's virtually. Um, I'll just briefly talk about uh, my work. Um, it starts from an interest in other species, not an interest in science fiction or the future or cyborgs. Me as a child, I was very interested in the amount of organs and senses that other species have. Uh, some, some animals can sense infrasounds, some others ultrasounds, infra uh, colors or ultraviolets. Um, some animals can sense where the magnetic north is. There's animals with electroception. So I was really fascinated about the amount of senses and organs that other animals have. And I was particularly interested in um, sense of color, how many animals could sense colors that we humans could not sense. And I was interested in color because I've never seen color. So I was interested in finding a way of sensing color myself. Uh, that's why in 2003, I created the project with a friend in order to create a new organ that would allow me to sense colors. But I didn't want to change my sight, so I didn't want to do anything with my sight. I wanted to create a new way of sensing color. And then we created an antenna, which is now implanted in my head, and it allows me to sense the vibrations of color from infrared to ultraviolet. So the dominant color in front of me enters the antenna and it vibrates inside my head. First, this system was uh, a wearable, so we created it as a wearable in 2003. And then uh, I tried to find a way of having it surgically implanted. And then I found a doctor willing to drill my skull so that the system would be surgically implanted inside my head. So I see this as a cyborg surgery uh, or a transspecies surgery, because it's basically adding senses and organs that are not traditionally human. So now the antenna is officially part of my body, part of my skeleton. So it's impossible to, to remove. Also the internet connection in my head now allows me to also receive colors from other parts of the world. I don't have to sense the colors in front of me uh, alone. I can also receive colors from the internet. So this allows me to extend my senses beyond my body. So I can be sensing colors that are far away from me, even from other continents or uh, from um, friends that can send colors to my head through their mobile phones. So I see this as the use of the internet as a sense. We've been using the internet as a communication system uh, and as a tool for many decades now, but I think the next stage is that we'll start seeing the use of the internet, uh, internet as a sense itself. This connection also allows me to connect to NASA's International Space Station. And when I do this, my sense of color is no longer in Earth, but in space. So this allows me to explore the colors from space without having to physically go there. I see this as becoming a sensetronaut, which is basically that we can now explore space without having to physically travel to space. If we all had senses uh, uh, or our bodies connected to sensors in space, we would be able to explore space continuously without having to physically go there. After some months of uh, hearing colors and merging with technology, I, I stopped feeling the difference between the software and my brain. And that's when I started defining myself as a cyborg, because I started to feel that I wasn't using or wearing technology. I started to feel that I was becoming technology. So when I stopped feeling this difference between software and brain is when I started defining myself as a cyborg. And that's uh, something that I tried to explain to the UK passport office in 2004, because I didn't allow me to renew my passport photo. They said there was a problem with the photo that electronic equipment is not allowed in passport photos. I replied saying that I felt that I was a cyborg and that I uh, uh, treated the antenna as an organ, not as a device or an electronic equipment. In the end, they, they accepted this explanation and, and they allowed me to appear in the passport with the antenna. I'm now also in conversations with the Swedish government because the Materials that I use to create the antenna are Swedish. So I'm telling them that I am Swedish because part of my body is Swedish. So I think I should also be entitled to become a Swedish citizen because um, part of my body is Swedish, but they still haven't 
replied. In 2010, I created the Cyborg Foundation with Monrivas uh, to help other people become cyborgs. So we've created several projects in universities where we create systems that can be applied to the body in order to have new senses. And also we defend the cyborg rights, which are basically these ones. The, one of the basic ones is freedom of morphology, um, freedom from being disassembled, uh, the right of treating these new uh, implants as body parts, uh, also the right to decide who's allowed to enter our bodies. So having internet connection makes us vulnerable to being physically hacked. So we need the right to de decide who is allowed to enter our bodies. Through all these years, I've only been hacked once, but I actually liked it. It was an interesting experience, but if it, if it was a bad experience, then we should have rights that protect us. And last is that we are all equal, no matter how many modifications you have. I think that we will see cyber clinics in the near future and it will be a huge change. We will see more people merging with technologies once we have these bioethical committees accepting these types of surgeries. For now, all these surgeries need to be done by anonymous doctors, mine as well. So my, my surgery was not accepted by a bioethical committee because it goes beyond the limitations of human perception. Sensing infrared and ultraviolets, they didn't see this as ethical. Having a new body part, such as an, an, an antenna, they didn't find this as ethical. So I think that once we find a country accepting these types of surgeries, we will see the world's first the cyber clinics, and then we will see more people merging with, with technology. Creating new senses gives you new experiences, and new experiences gives you new knowledge. I think this is something that we should be uh, conscious about, that having new senses will eventually give us new knowledge of, of our surroundings. All knowledge comes through our senses. So the more senses we have, the more possibilities of gaining knowledge of reality and of ourselves we will have. So I think it is ethical to add new senses. Also, the more we modify ourselves, the less we'll have to modify our planet. If we all had night vision, for example, we wouldn't have to use artificial light. Uh, all cities would be dark at night and we would be able to see ourselves without having to spend energy creating artificial light, or if we could create an organ that would allow us to control our own temperature, we wouldn't have to use heaters or air conditionings. We wouldn't change the temperature of our planet if we could change our own temperature. So I think it will slowly be seen as ethical that the more we decide to des design ourselves, the better it will be not only for us, but also for the planet. Also new senses creates new cultures. In my case, hearing colors has changed the way I dress, for example, now I can dress in C major, in F minor, or in uh, a melody, because I hear the vibrations of color. So I can dress in a way that it sounds good. I can also paint what I hear. This is Mozart's Queen of the Night. So I've painted it note by note from the middle to the end. This is Baby Baby by Justin Bieber, also transposed into color. I can also compose music with food, so I can eat songs. Uh, so I call this sonochromatic gastronomy, where you can, here you see the chef, um, Creating, creating a, a dish that sounds good. So basically by placing the colors on the plate and with the same chip inside the plate, you can actually hear the sound of the colors. I don't see this as AI, I see this as AS. So in my case, the antenna is an artificial sense, not artificial intelligence. If the antenna was telling me the names of colors, if the antenna was saying blue, yellow, pink, that would be AI. But I didn't want technology to give me intelligence. I wanted technology to give me a sense. So uh, when you merge with an artificial sense, the intelligence will be created by your brain and it will be a slow process. So when you merge with AI, the intelligence is given to you by the machine. When you merge with AS, the intelligence will slowly be created by your own brain. Other people merged with artificial senses are Pau Prats, Manel de Aguas, Joe Dagny, Moon Rivas, Kai Lander, and there's more and more. Um, Moon, for example, had the seismic sense where she, she could feel earthquakes. Joe has echolocation, so he can feel presence around him. Manel de Aguas has two fins here to sense the weather. Pau Press can sense uh, ultraviolet uh, levels. And Kai Lander has the cosmic sense, so he can feel cosmic rays. We don't see this as virtual reality. The, rea the, reali the reality that we've created through these senses is not augmented either. We see it as a revealed reality. It's technology that is revealing parts of reality that already exists, but that our bodies cannot sense. So in a way, merging with technology allows us to reconnect with nature and it allows us to sense parts of nature that we as a species have never been able to sense 
or have lost uh, through the th thousands of years. And most of us identify more as trans species, not so much as transhuman. Transhumans are usually more human centered, whereas trans species are more eco centered. Uh, in our case, we are not trying to become better humans. Uh, we are trying to reconnect with nature and we try to uh, get closer to other species because adding senses that other species have can actually allow us to reconnect with other species in a, in a way that we, we haven't through all these years. I think we've isolated ourselves as a species and this is something that we want to break by adding senses and organs that other species have. In my case, having an antenna makes me feel closer to other species that have antennas or sensing infrared and ultraviolet allows me to feel closer to species that have ultraviolet and infrared uh, perception as well. Now, the last project is adding this cyborg art in the crypto art. So we are actually, uh, the last project we've sold connection to our bodies as in the form of an NFT. So we are merging crypto art with cyborg art by uh, selling access to our bodies in the form of an NFT. So connection to my antenna is now in the blockchain and it will be there forever until I die. And also uh, artist Paul Lombardi has sold access to his heart uh, through uh, an NFT as well. So the person that buys his NFT can see his heartbeats live and also can interact with his heart so he can, uh, or the person that buys the NFT can see how he or she alters the other person's um, heart. We see this as art, the art of creating new senses, new organs, and the art of modifying our perception of reality. But we know that this has also a social uh, aspect. It's an art that has social implications. And um, we are also concerned and, and we, um, that uh, we need to, to be um, careful in how we use technology. Hopefully we will use it to reconnect with nature and with other species. And it will allow us to, as I said before, to stop changing the planet and start changing ourselves in order to adapt ourselves to uh, the planet and to nature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Can everyone see me? Ah, yeah, there we go. Hello, um, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm sure everyone has some questions for Neil. Um, so please write them in the little Q&A box at the bottom of uh, the window and we will get to those at the end of the discussion. Um, so yeah, it was really great to get an introduction into some of the technologies and the people who are spearheading this movement. Um, I guess now we're going to move into the discussion section of this event. So I'd like to invite everyone back into the room, if possible. Hello. Hello. Hi, Anders. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, the same. Yeah. Welcome. OK, so um, yeah, I wanted to start things off um, kind of talking about the near future. Um, and I feel like we can't have a conversation these days without mentioning the pandemic. So I thought it might be a good place to start. Um, I feel like many people might be able to resonate with how technology has helped us stay connected during this time. Um, and the role of technology in our everyday lives has really expanded and accelerated quite rapidly in a short period of time. Um, Anders, I thought as someone whose job is to kind of research the future, um, I wanted to ask you whether you thought there was any implications of this rapid acceleration in terms of a transhumanist movement. Do you think it maybe helps in the sense that people are more open to using technology in like an integrated way? Well, partially it's of course because we're forced to use the technology. We simply had to learn how to live with uh, the virtual conferences. Something that of course people have been talking about since the 90s. I was involved in virtual reality myself in the 1990s and it didn't work that well. And even tele uh, teleconferences didn't work that well. And then gradually they became better and then we're all forced into it. And that actually also forced us to learn how to do it better. And we have now partially, I think, uh, learn how to use it when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. And I think some of that is going to remain. Similarly, one of the great success stories of this pandemic was the extremely rapid development of the vaccines. Now, it's worth recognizing that the vaccine is on that border between enhancement and medical treatment. 
in some sense, you could say, this is a global technological immune system. And it's not just that people develop the old fashioned version of the vaccine, but the new mRNA vaccines look very, very promising as not just a treatment for COVID, but for treating quite a lot of other diseases, including uh, malaria and maybe some cancers. And even there is some hope for modulating the immune system for multiple sclerosis. And of course, I immediately started thinking, how could I use that also for enhancement? The fact that the technology <laughs> exists is that getting tested and people actually are learning what works, what doesn't work, is certainly going to help that. But most people are certainly probably not wanting to get into a transhuman future because of COVID. Rather, they want to return to the normal. We want to get out there and have a normal life. So while pandemics cause grandiose changes and a shared global event, they're not exactly the best way of selling human enhancement. They're not the way we want to be thrust into the future. Ideally, we would have got into the future because we then decided these technologies are nice, let's try them out. So it's good that we have them. And it's good that we can be ready for an, an emergencies. But generally, I think it's the exploration that happens kind of in more normal time that is the important part. Mm, interesting. So you don't think that this brings us closer to this singularity that David was talking about? A little bit. I think uh, certainly it demonstrates that we can do some things amazingly fast. The irony is, of course, that it took weeks since between the virus was sequenced and the vaccine actually existed in a test tube. But then, it, of mm. course, it had to take months of testing and bureaucratic delays um, that it took even longer and getting society to organize how to actually produce and spread the vaccine. So if there one dramatic demonstration we had during the pandemic is that our coordination mechanisms, our the societal mechanisms are not on that quick. And this is mm -hmm. a real problem. If technology gets very fast, but our society can't adapt well to it, then we're in trouble. At the same time, I was pleasantly surprised how much society managed to adapt. It failed in many ways too. Different nations failed in a lot of different ways. But there was a lot of demonstration that we can change if we really have to. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe on the other side of that and like opening it up to the other panelists as well. Um, Jem, you spoke a bit about skin to face um, and about, you know, a technology like that could have been really useful during COVID. Um, I wondered whether you could talk a bit about other technologies that might have really had an influence had they existed during this period of time. I guess um, Caroline's project could have been really useful as well because there was a lot that continues to be, because um, we're kind of still in the pandemic, there continues to be a huge ripple effect of mental health issues. So if there was a way of seeking treatment for that which was digital and you didn't have to go to a hospital for it then that could be hugely beneficial as well um i can't think of any others really specific to covid offhand but i think that the i think just those two examples show the kind of breadth and depth of possibility in terms of just using the experience of the pandemic to think about okay what what we what could we develop in those spaces mm. to um, kind of alleviate some of the issues. I mean, technology. I don't believe technology can necessarily solve everything, but I think it's really interesting how some of these individuals are using it as a tool to heal and kind of, yeah, make good on difficult human experiences, mm. challenging human experiences. Yeah. And um, Neil, I thought it was interesting how you speak about kind of connecting to nature. Um, and I feel like that's something that we all really appreciated during the pandemic as well. Um, I wondered like, what are some of the um, other ways in which you've experienced how technology can make us feel closer to the environment? And what does that actually feel like? Um, well, sensing the magnetic north, Moon, Man Manel and I have an implant in our knee that allows us to feel where the magnetic north is. So this allows you to feel the, the earth in a specific way. Also, I'm developing now the sense of time, which is a point of heat that takes 24 hours to go around my body. So it allows me to feel the rotation of the planet. It's just uh, using technology to sense things that we can't sense. Uh, and, and then 
obviously with these new senses, you can just explore and experience nature uh, in real life uh, with new layers. Uh, I think, mm -hmm. see there's a new way of exploring Earth. Our ancestors explored Earth by traveling, I guess, or going up mountains or going crossing the seas. Now we can explore our planet by adding new layers or adding new senses. And I think this is what really fascinates us all here. Our aim, as I said, is not specifically to become better humans. It's, it's just to find ways of experiencing life and exploring nature and, and our, our reality uh, by revealing parts of this, this reality. And this doesn't necessarily make you better or worse. Mm. And is that also a process of like connecting with other people as well while doing so? It yeah. can, because uh, the more senses you have, the more ways of sensing someone else you have, I guess, uh, sensibility or sense, um, how do you say it, like uh, intuition as well, or, or connection is through our senses as well. We connect with things and with other people by sensing uh, mm. other people. So the more ways of sensing your surroundings, the more way you have of connecting. But it really does open a door to connecting with other species because you suddenly share a sense that another species have. In my case, that's my cat, for example, if I see my cat staring at a wall and I sense there's infrared, I understand mm. that the cat is staring at the infrared, not at the wall. Or um, if you see bees going to a specific flower because there's a high level of ultraviolet, you understand the species in, a, or in this case, the, the bees in a, in a different way. So different ways of reconnecting with other species. Mm. That's interesting. And the um, magnetic north that you were talking about, is that the same as David? I remember when we spoke before, you talked about the north sense. No, is it's a different one. Different? Yeah, the north, uh, sensing north has been uh, explored by many groups of people since the, I think since the very early 2000s, like in Austria, mm. some group of people created the belt, then other people created the necklace. We simply uh, had a compass implanted in our knee so years ago, Moon, Manel and I, and this allows us to feel a, a, a small pressure when we face north. Mm, that's interesting. Um, David, I remember you were telling me about how um, with the North, uh, north Sense, uh, the person who had it said that it changed the way they remembered things. Yeah, so, right? yeah, so like, I think like Neil was saying, the, the, these, these additional senses can add more layers to how you perceive the world. Um, so yeah, that's uh, Livu um, Babbitt, who I think worked with you, Neil. Did he on the? Yeah, we we developed the one version of the of Sensing North. Yeah, but yeah. Sense, as I said, Sensing North is one of 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 uh, of the senses that many groups have worked on because it's simple. It's a compass that allows you to feel magnetic north, and there are different ways of of merging with it and. Yeah, it's interesting because all senses can uh, add new memories uh, or help you also remember things through different senses because we also remember things things by what we felt and it's it it it's more um i i'm i'm shocked that we talk so much about ai but not so much about as because senses can really change the way we interact with with everything uh, and the way we perceive everything but now we are still focusing a lot on ai and not so much in as mm. anders what do you think about this do you feel like i mean would the world be a better place if we all had as <laughs> I, I think so uh, generally the, the the paradox is that the modern world consists of us getting rid of a lot of the complexity and the central aspects of the world, because it's much more effective to have a flat road. It's much more easy to concentrate on something abstract if you're in an office with uh, walls rather than in a forest with a lot of insects around. So we have created rather sterile environments. In fact, that's something I was struck by by all these filters. Most of us show up in extremely sterile environments of various kinds. And maybe sometimes that's a deliberate choice, but it also misses something. 
uh, I prefer to work in a messy office surrounded by my books and my beetles. And I would love to be able to see um, details of the polarization of the light pattern of the beetle wings, for example. Now, the really important thing for most of us is, of course, other people. And yes, anything that enhances communication is a big deal. This is why the smartphone has transformed the world to such a great degree. It's not just the elegant design. It's actually that thanks to that, most people are no longer ever alone or forgetful or lost. As uh, the science fiction author Charles Stross said several years ago, and now it's gotten even more extreme. It's just that mm, still looking at a little piece of glass in your hand might not be the same thing as actually looking somebody in the face. The nodding, the blinks, the interaction, even the smell of other people is important for responding the right way. And if we can come up with new ways of the linking up to each other, I think we can enhance that. One of the most interesting and mildly disturbing ideas is Miguel Nicolelis, a neuroscientist uh, at Duke University who connected the brains of different lab animals. And he has argued that he can see signs that they solve problems better. Basically, one of the animals can see the maze and the other one is running around in them. They don't have a language. He hasn't told them anything about how it's supposed to work. But according to a few of the papers, this seems to work better. Now, if we could do that kind of link between people, that might be both a way of enhancing performance, but also perhaps a way of reaching out to each other. Whether this actually works, whether brains can learn each other's language, is something we need to explore. And I think that is the most important part here. A lot of the proposals will not work or will be pointless. Some of them are going to change the world and we need to try them out and then see which of them are promising, which of them are just painful mistakes, and which of them are just fascinating and we could build on it. Mm, that's so interesting. Yeah, it's interesting to kind of think about the far future, isn't it? Um, and that's I my thought, job. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, Jem, you kind of mentioned in your presentation about how some transhumanists are um, focusing on sustainability and improving this connection with the environment. Um, and Neil, you also spoke about that as well. Um, I wondered, you know, what are some of the potentials um, of these technologies to, you know, aid our journey towards a more sustainable lifestyle? That's an intense question. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I can answer the full part of that question, but I guess one of the most interesting people in the context that you're talking about in terms of connecting to nature beyond Neil um, was Moon Rebus, who Neil mm. mentioned briefly before, who had sensors in her hands and her feet and she could sense the seismic activity of the planet, which as an artist and specifically a dancer and a choreographer, she kind of melded those worlds together and used this new sense and, and her proximity to the planet and her, I guess, deepening relationship with the planet to inform her choreography and her performance. And mm. that was a really moving application of being closer to nature. In terms of sustainability, I'm not sure I'm, I can answer that. I'm not sure if Anders might be the better person to answer that. Well, I, I think uh, the best way of enhancing sustainability is probably not to modify ourselves right now, although it might be a good idea to get uh, a night vision, uh, etc. That's not going to totally transform how we interact with the world. For that, we actually need both solar panels, nanotechnology to make recycling perfect, etc. It's mostly external things, at least um, for the foreseeable future. I actually have written an essay where I looked at the end game. Some people are becoming vegetarian. But what's beyond vegetarianism? Well, what if you actually uploaded yourself into a computer and run on sunlight. Now you don't even need to eat plants. So in some sense, that's the ultimate ethical approach to sustainability. You're a solid state and you only need sunlight. But that's still a bit away. Even though I'm optimistic mm. about uh, eventually getting there, that's going to take many decades. So in the short, the best approach to sustainability is actually in figuring out ways of using artificial intelligence to make recycling work well, automate uh, ways of uh, extracting materials so you can do that in a sustainable way, performing the transition from a carbon economy uh, to a renewable economy, etc. But a lot of that is relatively remote from the individual. 
But I still think there is something interesting here about the interplay. Some of my friends are working on biotechnology and biohacking, both of human biohacking, but also thinking about could we make biotechnologies that help instead of having a mine, why not plant uh, plants literally that extract the metals? And I think what is happening is that it's not just that we transform the human, we're transforming nature. And of course, this is equally controversial. Many people are upset enough when you mess around with the human nature, but nature itself to many today, you know, kind of post-religious sense is still the source of meaning, the assumption that, okay, we can at least trust nature have a struggle. And of course, let me just this question to say the natural order. No, 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 that's changing. Evolution is already changing, and we're just one part of evolution, changing it at an even riskier pace. And that tends to cause a lot of heat. Mm. Um, we've got quite a few questions building up. Um, there's some good ones here. So I thought maybe we'll move on to some of those. Um, so we've got the first one here. Um, are there any questions or thoughts about God with any of the people involved, or is everyone starting with a view of an atheist? Well, well my experience in the transhumanist mo movement is, uh, yeah, the bulk of transhumanists I met tend to be atheists and agnostics, and then there is a surprisingly big contingent of Buddhists. And then mm. there is the Christian uh, Transhumanist Association, the Mormon Transhumanist Association. Indeed, some of the precursors to modern transhumanists, like Nikolai Fyodorov in Russia, was explicitly coming up with a proto-transhumanist based on his orthodox Christian faith. God wants us to become immortal and colonize space, according to him. And he was very influential on Tsiolkovsky and uh, Van Korolev and the Russian space program. So, mm it's possible to combine transhumanists with religious views. I think it's relatively rare, but they do show up indeed. Uh, I'm having an online conversation right now uh, with some Catholic the theologians about, the, basically they're arguing about Thomist uh, scholasticism versus the Oxford transhumanist views. And we're having so much philosophical fun. <laughs> <laughs> David, Jen, did you come across anyone in your project? Um, not, not as many as I wanted to. I was really keen to visit the Christian transhumanists in America because I thought they sounded fascinating, but uh, uh, we ran out of time there. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it always struck me the whole way along, photographing the, the, the work actually, that uh, there's a lot of link with the classic uh, religious story of, of becoming immortal, being born again, being rejuvenated. Um, there's a there's a very close link with um, um, you know biblical story in that in that sense and um, and again in, in in Russia when we visited Russia there was uh, it was it was there were so many coincidences and so many links to um, the Russian cosmism out there that, that, that the cryogenic freezing facility in Russia itself is in one of the holiest. Russian Orthodox uh, uh, cities in, um, where pilgrims visit, you know. So this idea mm. of um, of being reborn is right at the centre of of uh, a pilgrimage site. It's really intriguing. Really close links. Um, yeah, it. Yeah, I I I was interested to hear Anders' uh, answer there, but I, it always struck me that it was quite close to religion. But mm, interesting. Um, we've got a couple questions for Neil. Um, firstly, how was it getting used to the colours in the beginning? Um, chaotic, because uh, it was a, a new sense, it was a new stimuli, so it took many months for my brain to start uh, accepting first the new stimuli and then making sense mm -hmm. of the new sense. So it was a slow process both to getting used to the new sense and then also getting used to the, the new organ. It's two, two things that you need to get used to. Uh, in the case of the antenna, I'm, I'm a bit taller now. So this, this, this slight change of height uh, did make a change and also getting used to that me me mechanic uh, or electronic echo in my head. Uh, little things that I have, I have no name, specific name maybe. And, but yeah, there's two things, getting used to the input and then getting used to the new organ, and it, take, it took some months. Mm. 
Um, and a little follow up question there. Have you ever experienced any anomalies with your antenna? Sometimes I have antenna aches, which is like uh, having a headache or a toothache or uh, it's feeling that I have the antenna. Uh, now I, I don't feel the antenna in the same way that I, I don't feel my ear. Uh, so when I feel the antenna, it means that I feel maybe there's a change of pressure. And mm -hmm. anomaly, sometimes I sense infrared in spaces where it doesn't make any sense that there is infrared. So sometimes I feel uh, that there's a infrared in spaces that uh, it, to me, it creates some kind of mystery. Mm. And is, this, is the antenna something you're constantly updating as well? Yeah, that's the, the advantage of, of having a cybernetic organ is that it can get better and better through the years instead of having your senses degenerate, which it happens with the organic uh, senses. Mm. Cybernetic organs can actually get better and better through, through the years. So in my case, I see that the older I get, maybe the better I will sense reality if oh, I can keep up upgrading my senses. How many models have you had so far? Well, what I've changed was, well, in 2004, I was sensing the visual spectrum. In 2008, I added infrared and ultraviolet perception. Mm. In 2012, 13, I added internet connection. But the antenna is still fiber optic, which is inside this. So the antenna is actually inside, and I've changed this cover uh, mm. because it gets old, and this tip can also be changed. But what I change is the cover of the antenna. The, the mm. fiber optic is inside. Interesting. Um, we've got a question for David and Jem from Rachel. Um, I'm interested to hear thoughts in general on the role of art and photography in relation to transhumanism. For example, can it fuel the dystopian vision or provide a more seductive utopian vision? How do David and Jem see their work in this context? Yeah, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. I'll jump in on that one there. Um, yeah, we were we were very keen to sort of not give our opinion in the in the photography and not either create dystopian or utopian work, just to try and present it um, in as neutral way as possible. I I, I think um, we set out to photograph people in their own environment, so at home or in their in their basement or at their workplace, rather than um, in a in a seductive location or a dystopian location, everything was lit in a in a in a very uniform way. Again, just to try and provide a sort of a blanket document of of of, of the work. So, I I I think maybe sometimes we show some of the images in a in a more utopian light and some edge more to dystopian. But I hope somewhere it it balances in the, in the middle. I hope we achieve that. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, well, I guess I agree with what you said. I think I think a big part of this is less about, as you say, putting an opinion on this and more about documenting a moment in time. This is this is a significant shift that we're witnessing and kind of what we're getting into today is such a tiny proportion of, of this movement in all its forms. And so it was definitely, and, and that's something that we haven't even managed to, you know, encapsulate in the project. I mean, we photographed 80 people, um, I think, as part of the movement. So it, this really is a slice of something, but it, the motivation was very much to document a moment in time in the same way that, you know, photography has been used as a tool to document all kinds of things throughout history. It was very much, that was kind of our, our agenda. Yeah, it was also it was also interesting to try and document document things that don't actually exist yet. Document philosophies and uh, ideas. That 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 was a, mm. an intriguing challenge right from day one, wasn't it? Just to sort yeah. of um, uh, quite often it's just within a within a portrait or within a de detail that we have to do that. But um, yeah, that was challenging sometimes. Yeah, Could you maybe give. Sorry, could I you maybe give like an, sorry. <laughs> you go, you go. <laughs> I was wondering if you could maybe like give an example of a picture in which you did that, David. Um, yeah, I mean, I <laughs> that failed actually. I attempted to, I attempted to 
uh, illustrate the threat posed by artificial intelligence uh, by photographing a paperclip. And I think Anders will probably understand that one. But uh, that one went in the bin. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I went to photograph a, a, a nematode worm at uh, uh, UCL in London, which um, uh, a lady called Natasha Vita Moore had been doing experiments with this worm to see if when she froze it and defrosted the worm, did it retain its memory? And her, her, um, her, she concluded that, her experiment concluded that yes, the memory had been retained. And this, this was work that feeds into cryogenic freezing and uh, resuscitation. So yeah, I went to photograph a microscopic worm that you, you cannot see. Um, it's just a petri dish with some jelly in it. But <laughs> it holds this sort of, hopefully holds this uh, great metaphor for uh, uh, rebirth. But yeah, and the, 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 the light coming off it is all this is very religious and it sort of glows in the dark. And um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Utopian worm. Yeah, Utopian worm. <laughs> I'll show you the shot sometime, Anders. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Jen, were you going to add something before I, I interrupt? I totally you? forgot <laughs> what it was. So. Oh, <laughs> okay. I, you know what I was going to say? I was just going to say, I think this is one of those projects that pushes up against the limitations of photography. As David said, like some, some of these things are, are kind of theories and some of them are just very difficult to um, visualise. And so that was quite an interesting challenge throughout, just trying to think about how photography can relate to some of these subjects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we have a question here, which is perhaps for Dem Gem and David. Um, would any of the presenters consider becoming transhuman? I've seen David pull this face a lot. <laughs> Oh. I, mean, I, I technically, I'm not transhuman, but I have started using wearable devices a lot more. Hmm. I've, I've got a wearable device which can help you, if you, I suffer from anxiety, it can help you move from fight or flight into the other state, which is the opposite. Um, and it's a wearable device that kind of vibrates on your chest and kind of, um, yeah, affects your vagus nerve. So. I've started experimenting with things like that and they've been really interesting um, to use, but that's very, you know, that's not transhumanism. That's more just like a wearable kind of yeah. futurist device. Yeah. Mm. I was going to add, I'm not really sure where transhuman and transhumanism starts and finishes. We are, we all transhumanists when we have an iPhone, like mm. um, we were talking about earlier. I don't, I don't know. I think out of everybody we photographed, I think, um, the work that sort of Neil and Moon were undertaking appeals to me as a photographer, as an artist who's perceiving the world around me uh, constantly. I think it must be incredible to start to be able to perceive in a deeper, richer way and um, and understand uh, understand things in a different way. Um, that that must be uh, amazing. Let's start a project then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about a permanent impact though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to think about, isn't it? Because um, I think I heard a podcast or something where Neil, you pointed out that um, it, even in our language, we say things like, I'm running out of battery, or I'm running out of juice. And I was trying to think of some other examples. Yeah, but... this is like, a, we call these a psychological cyborgs, people that are already psychologically united mm. to cybernetics, because cyborg means cybernetic organism, but the union can be physical or it can be psychological. And psychologically, most people I know are uh, mm. already merged with technology and they use language in such a way, like, as you said, in 20 years ago, people said, my mobile phone is running out of battery. And now people say, I'm running out of battery. So this, mm -hmm. and you can see this in several different ways in, the, in, in language uh, and in the way they treat technology as well, if they treat this, already treat it as, a, as an extension of themselves. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think there, we're not too far away from, from normalizing, merging physically with technology because most uh, teenagers are already merged psycho psychologically. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe the answer to that question is that we are already unknowingly becoming transhumanists. I think there's um, a term, I think there's a term actually in the dictionary now called something like nomophobia, which is our fear of being away from our devices because we're so intertwined with them that yeah. it's actually a disorder now. <laughs> which is just wild. The real challenge is, of course, selecting your devices. I'm uh, probably one of the more low-tech transhumanists. I'm a bit of a Luddite transhumanist uh, among my circle of friends because I'm usually selecting what devices and methods I use rather carefully. And typically, I wait until the others have tested it and it seems to work out well because I do think one needs to be critical about it. And this is one of the interesting things about this project, because this is all about exploring and testing out some technologies, and some of them are not going to work out. And I think we should be all aware of kind of, okay, do I want that app? Do I want this book to be part of my mind? And actually selecting what you uh, integrate with yourself is going to be a pretty important survival skill, but it's also something we don't know how to do well yet. So we need to do a lot of trial and error. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got a couple more questions coming up here. Um, there's an ethical question here. Um, maybe Anders, this is a good one for you. Um, in a future where tech augmentation will be widely spread and functional, um, this will definitely be expensive. Um, how, basically, how can we make sure that everyone can afford it uh, when poor or middle class would be would not be able to access it? A lot depends on what kind of technology it is. Mm -hmm. So this thought originally comes from Ramas Nam, uh, a, a very good transhumanist writer and uh, environmentalist. And he pointed out that pills and gadgets come down exponentially price over time. You mass produce them, they get cheaper and cheaper, unless you have some patent keeping the price over. On the other hand, mm -hmm. services tend to be expensive because you need to pay for the doctors and nurses doing what it is. So if you can make the enhancements be more like pills and phones, then they can become cheap. But if you need to go to the enhancement spa for somebody to massage your brain or uh, update your genes, then it's going to stay quite expensive. Sometimes some enhancements are so good, we decide, okay, let's pay this uh, using taxpayer money, like education. The fact that we've spent enormous amount of money on giving education to kids shows that sometimes even expensive enhancements are so good that they're worth subsidizing. But generally, I think on the technology side, if you can turn them into something uh, that are easy uh, to make cheap, that's a great thing. There is probably going to be a lot of back and forth about what's essential and what is a luxury. When I grew up, it used to be that, yeah, having an extra phone, oh, that's a total luxury. And then in the 90s, well, having a cell phone, yeah, that's a little bit of a status symbol. Actually, it's pretty useful. And today, I need this one in order to log in in various places to identify myself. And suddenly, it's actually in a, in a quite a part of me. And not being allowed to have a cell phone would actually hinder my life significantly. It become almost mandatory. It's not quite there yet, but it, give it a few decades more. And uh, we would say that phoneless people, yeah, how can we help those people? than the guy so mm, mm. um okay i think we have time for one more question and maybe this is a good lead on um should there be a greater focus in transhumanism on the ethos of ending suffering um do you think we need a collective ethical grounding in pursuing these technologies yeah i, th I think that that is an interesting one because sitting in the philosophy department i uh, end up with so many different philosophical takes on this. And generally, it's a strong position that we should end suffering or reduce it as much as possible. I think very few people are completely against that. But whether this has top priority or whether it's kind of, we should bring up the average, that depends quite a lot on different thinkers. And it's very hard to unify. The, the dirty secret of transhumanism is that we don't agree on a shared value theory. The Christian transhumanists and the existential transhumanists both might want to enhance themselves, but why? That's going to be, have very different answers. So I think there is a challenge here. Mm. Um, so I said that was the last question, but I feel bad for not answering this um, other person's question as a few people want to know. Um, is Neil the only cyborg from the north of Ireland? 
<laughs> is this a quiz? Is anyone else? I... <laughs> I think cyborg is more of an identity. It's uh, if you identify as a cyborg, then you are a cyborg. It, it, it has nothing to do with the body because I've, I've met like people that have cybernetic implants, but they don't identify as being a cyborg. I think being a cyborg is anyone that includes technology as part of their identity, no matter what the body uh, looks like. You might have implants and not include these implants as part of your identity, uh, uh, or you don't. You might not define yourself as a cyborg, and it can happen the other way around. So I'm sure there are many cyborgs in 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 Ulster, in Ulster and in. I know, I know. I know of one who is. Uh, uh, he's he's. Uh, I think his parents are from Northern Ireland. So Rob Spence, the eyeborg with the camera in his eye, he, his, uh, his, uh, his family all hail from just outside Belfast somewhere. And um, mm. he, he lost his eye on his grandfather's farm just outside Belfast. So he does have a link. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you all so much. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, and thank you everyone for submitting your questions. Um, also like to thank all four of the panelists um, and a massive thank you to Belfast Photo Festival for organizing the event um, and for inviting us to be a part of it. Um, David and Jem's project is going to be on show at the Atypical Gallery in Belfast until is it the end of the month? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I believe a recording of this event is going to be made available as well at a later date. Um, David, were you going to add anything? Uh, no, I was going to say what you just said. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, in Belfast. Great. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, I hope you all have a fantastic evening and a great rest of your week. Okay, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.